Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. Modern cosmology fuses the concepts of space and time into a thing called a four-dimensional continuum. Albert Einstein predicted, and recently scientists have claimed to observe, ripples in the so-called fabric of space-time. But is it valid to define time in such a way as to reify it? And does a more valid definition of time exist? Today, we explore one of the most basic questions in all of cosmology. What is time? First of all, let's make sure that we understand that there's a difference between the words time and eternity, because they're not the same. The definition of eternity may be somewhat difficult to talk about, but the definition of time can be very simple and clear. Since time is included in and affects not only our everyday lives, but also many physics equations and chemical formulations, a proper definition of time is of the utmost importance. It is helpful to realize that the chemical reactions in the vessel are not really affected by some mysterious thing called time, but by the number of contacts or collisions that take place in the soup of atoms or molecules. That is what the factor T, or time, really stands for. So, we have three premises. Number one, eternity may be a somewhat mystical overarching reality outside of the physical universe, but time is not. Nor is time a thing that anybody can do anything to. In other words, it cannot be reified. Premise number two. The universe doesn't exist in time, but time exists in the universe. Premise number three. The proper definition of time is exactly this. The sequence of events in the material universe. The notable philosopher Immanuel Kant, considered by some to be the center of modern philosophy, insists that he has given a rigorous and conclusive proof for the proposition that the universe had a beginning in time, and other philosophers has characterized the proof as certain. He also insists that he has given a rigorous and conclusive proof for the proposition that the universe did not have a beginning in time, and other philosophers have characterized the proof as certain. Of course, this is a straightforward violation of the law of contradiction, a concept held to be inviolate. Kant seems to suggest not that both of these proofs are true, but that they are both false. Well, this assertion of Kant's is a violation of another time-honored concept, the law of the excluded middle, which has it that two contradictory propositions cannot both be false, nor can these two be true. If two contradictory propositions can both be considered false, then they can both be considered true. And yet, Kant accepts the conclusion that they are both false and rejects the conclusion that they are both true. Houston, we have a problem here. What is going on? What is this problem? The following treatise on what time really is gives us the explanation. But I will relate first what the eminent philosopher G.E. Moore has to say about Kant's assertions. Quote, now suppose we say that, instead of proving these two propositions, what his proofs really prove is the following two hypothetical propositions. Namely, number one, if the world exists in time at all, then it must have had a beginning. And or two, if the world exists in time at all, then it can have had no beginning. For if we say that what Kant proved is merely these two hypotheticals, then he has not proved that these two contradictory propositions are both of them true. 
for these two hypotheticals do not contradict each other. Of course, clearly the if statements in both above are false. So, the bottom line is the universe does not exist in time, but time exists in the universe. Back in the summer of 2000, the chief astronomer and director of the U.S. Naval Observatory, the late Tom Van Flandern, and I were over in Italy to give presentations at the annual University of Milano Bergamo Symposium. Both of us were staying up in Bergamo, about an hour's train ride down to Milano. One morning, we sat together on the train and talked about time. He is the thinker that really kick-started me to deal philosophically with this subject. He said that he thinks about it along these lines. He asked me to imagine there was nothing except empty space with just a faucet in it. The faucet drips. The faucet drips again. He asked me how much time there was between the drips. And I saw and we agreed that the question was unanswerable. There was nothing that we could say. Then he asked me to visualize a second dripping faucet, one that drips 60 times for every time the first faucet drips. Now what can we say? Well, we can remark about the ratio being 60 to 1 on a regular basis. And then we add a third faucet that drips 60 times for every time the second faucet drips. Now we can remark not only about the mathematical ratios, but we can talk now about cycles within cycles and regularity in their relationships. Of course, you recognize the comparability to seconds and minutes and hours here. The experience of reality, the experience of life content, and the experience of meaning is based on events. The above seems to be so obvious that it is questionable to mention it. However, there are three types of events. The first are those that we relate to as quantitative, where they are triggered or created by the physical, mechanical cycles that have been set in motion and that have no further impact or meaning in and of themselves. And the second type is are those that we relate to as qualitative, where they are not cyclical, but have some good or bad impact on the quality of life. And three, those that are qualitative, but also purposeful, in that these events are triggered by some level of volition. Time and duration are based on cyclical quantitative events. The question was asked above, how much time is there between two events? We simply cannot say without counting the number of quantitative cycles that we are using as a background or matrix. A woven fabric, canvas if you will, upon which we can paint our experience. In other words, the number of times a clock ticks or the number of seasons, moon or solar cycles, etc. In our language, we often use the word time to be synonymous with the word event, as in, at the party, plates of food were spilled three times, or the batter came to the plate four times during the game. Consider the words eventual and eventually. Don't these words mean further downstream in time, in the sequence of future events? So, the arrow of time is based on sequence. Humans experience time as a directional series of sequential events, the smallest of which we are generally only subconsciously aware, being that of our own heartbeat, essentially equivalent to a second seconds to minutes to hours to days to weeks to months to years to decades to centuries to millennia all mechanically determined cyclical series of events events or series of events distinguishable from one another 
and in sequence provide for the reality of our time experience, including what we call time. We use uniform, cyclical, non-relevant events, such as the ticking of a clock, the vibrations of an atom, or the rotations or revolutions of the solar system, that mark out small increments of duration to help us better keep track of the sequence of more important relevant events. Put very straightly, without physical events to demarcate experience in a sequence, there would be no such thing as time. And this is important. The basis for a common concept or standard of time tracking must be externally imposed and corporately experienced and then counted and kept track of. One other aspect of time should be noted. Time is not measured against an artificial standard like the platinum bar in France for the meter, but the events are counted for time. The standard is built into our minds, and there is nothing arbitrary or artificial about it because it is based on adding the unit one for each item. Now, counts are either right or wrong. If done properly or correctly, they are absolutely right. Measurements are always approximations. And if precision is an issue, they are done several times and statistical analysis is applied using the mathematical technique of standard deviation. If there are a few marbles in a bag and we want to know how many, we count them. We do not apply some artificial standard and then measure them. There is little or no point in counting events unless they are essentially uniform. If an event is not effectively identical to another, it is in a class by itself. No need to count the number because it is one. We should all know in this discussion that the ancient accounts of creation are not descriptions of the creation of the physical universe, but are accounts of the creation of a new world environment a new cosmic order or a new age, the age of timekeeping. Sequence is inviolate to our most fundamental concept of reality, experience and logic. In other words, sequence can never be altered or reversed. If it could be, then the universe, the order of things, would be truly unstable and chaotic. The very word order is a synonym for sequence. There never could be any meaning because it could always be undone by changing the sequence of events. Sequence is one of those non-material realities that even applies to non-material events such as thoughts or imaginings. Now, Vibration and oscillation pervade our physical universe in every reversal of direction in an oscillation, every wiggle of every polarity of every particle, every Brownian motion collision, and all the other myriad events form a background fabric of time indicators in sequence. In the electric universe paradigm, Every particle electrically knows about every other in a connected universe. So, every event has some effect upon all the others, if only a vanishingly small and irrelevant one. Thus, when T as a symbol of time is used in a scientific equation or chemical formula, it doesn't stand for this mysterious, indefinable aspect of reality called time. But again, it represents the multitude of background events being demarcated by that period that have some effect upon the phenomenon. Existence is not based on time, but time is based on existence and events in the physical universe. In my opinion, we need to learn to think and talk more carefully about these fundamental issues.
Examples of nonsensical questions might be, was there ever a time when there was nothing? Or, was there ever a time before the physical universe existed? Or, what happens when time runs out? Or, if there was a beginning, what existed or happened before the beginning? So, to repeat, time is an aspect of or an adjunct to the physical universe based on physical events. Simply put, no material universe, no time. But that does not mean that time can be reified, because not time is not a thing in and of itself. Time is not something that can be slowed down or speeded up, nor can it be reversed. If synchronized clocks or metronomes get out of sync, one must then look at which mechanisms or processes that can cause that. But you can't go and think that time is being distorted. Also, dimensions are not something that can be reified in order to be compressed or stretched. The theories of relativity are thoroughly confused on both of these points. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to Thunderbolts.info.